Today on Basic Bytes, I'm going to be demonstrating desktop publishing of the 1980s with Printmaster Plus for the Commodore 64. If you remember dot matrix printers, this should invoke some nostalgia. But if you don't, then buckle in for a detailed historical recreation of what you would do to design even a simple poster back in the day. Greetings, it's JC at Basic Bytes. Printmaster Plus is my personal favorite desktop publishing software for the Commodore 64. Along with my trusty Commodore MPS 803 dot matrix printer, I do actually still use this software in the present day on a semi-regular basis. Usually, I'm designing crappy dot matrix greeting cards for acquaintances that well remember the 8-bit era and still appreciate the running joke. Even in 2022, just as I still very much appreciate sitting down at my manual typewriter and putting hammers to paper, there is still something uniquely satisfying about seeing and hearing a dot matrix printer faithfully hammering out a print job with pins on paper. Today's video is also going to have a bit of a somber element to it. I am Canadian. As I film this, it is September the 14th, and my entire nation is presently deeply in mourning for the loss of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada. And I, personally, am very much so as well. You may be right to question what that has to do with desktop publishing. Well, I thought it would be a much more authentic demonstration if I were actually designing something practical for you, rather than simply going back and forth between menus with a bunch of contrived examples. So, in this video, I will be making proclamation and in-memoriam type signage for Her Majesty's passing. Before I get on with it, I would very much like to emphasize that this is in no way meant to be frivolous or disrespectful. Her Majesty is presently being tributed in many forms and mediums, and certainly the 8-bit era has, in retrospect, taken on a look and feel of its very own. Moreover, everything that I'm doing here is absolutely authentic to what would have been available to a home user in the 1980s designing such signage for a club or legion, for example. Therefore, keeping in mind the technological limitations that we are working with, my aim today is to nonetheless create a design that is aesthetically pleasing and, of course, you are welcome to leave me a comment later to tell me if you think I succeeded in that endeavor. Now, throughout that introduction, a good number of you were probably yelling at your screen, saying, Hey, JC, have you lost it? That isn't Printmaster Plus. That isn't even Printmaster. That's Print Shop. And yes, you would be correct. Uh, this is Print Shop, or THE Print Shop, for the Commodore 64, released by Broderbun Software in 1984. The reason why I have this up on screen to begin with is because I would be remiss not to introduce Printmaster Plus with a short story from computing history that also involves one of the most infamous technology lawsuits of the 1980s. If you were around in the 1980s and have any recollection of going into computer labs to design greeting cards, signs, letterheads, banners, and the like, it is very probable that the print shop is the software that you were using at the time. This was a breakthrough piece of software for desktop publishing, and it quickly became one of the best-selling software packages of the era due to its incredible ease of use. We aren't going to spend very long here, but let's just say, for example, you wanted to design a greeting card. The software would then ask you if you wanted to make a new one or load from disk, 
at which point it would simply begin stepping you through the process of creating the card. You would select your border, and then you would select a graphic, for example. If you didn't pick the largest size, it would ask you how you wished to place that graphic, and then you would choose your font, and so on and so forth. And now for comparison, let's load up Print Master. Note that we are not at Print Master Plus yet. This is just the regular original Print Master, which was released the following year in 1985 by Unison World. Also note on screen, it says Commodore version by Berkeley Softworks. We're going to come back to that. The Printmaster disk has its own built-in disk-based fast loader, so if you have a fast load cartridge, you might want to disable that with this version of the software to avoid any potential conflicts. You'll also note that as the software was loading, the screen changed from gray to green. One of the few features that did not make it into Printmaster Plus that I rather wish had is that Printmaster despite the fact that the screen is monochrome, allows you to select your preferred color, and I happen to rather like the green. Now that we are in the software, aside from the green, you may notice that this looks extremely familiar. Greeting card, sign, stationery, prominent edition of calendar, which was very useful back in the day, but then we have banner, graphic editor, etc. So let's just do what we did in the print shop. Greeting card. Hmm, still looking rather familiar. Let's design our own. Next step, pick your border. All right. Choose your graphic. Christmas tree, why not? Select graphic size and layout. If you think you're having deja vu at this moment, you are not. This is, in fact, eerily similar to the print shop. So much so, in fact, that the following year after its release in 1986, Broderbund sued Unison World for copying the print shop. Ultimately, the court found in favor of Broderbund and that Unison World had indeed substantially copied the print shop. <coughs> now, if I left the story there, you might be inclined to think that Unison World were just a bunch of no good, dirty plagiarists. And while it is true that they were found to have plagiarized, the rest of the story is that Broderbund had actually asked Unison World to develop a clone of the print shop for the IBM PC, being that the print shop at that point was only available for the Commodore and Apple series of computers. Unison World got its programmers working on that project, but for whatever reason, the contract between Broderbund and Unison World was not finalized. Unison World, wanting to preserve the work it had already done, decided that it wanted to release desktop publishing software for the IBM PC regardless, so they finished the program, and that's how Printmaster was born. We can presume that Unison World approached Berkeley Softworks to develop the Commodore version of its Printmaster software for the IBM PC in similar fashion to how Broderbund had initially approached Unison World to request that they develop the IBM PC version of their print shop software for the Commodore and Apple. Ultimately, the lawsuit forced Unison World to redesign the look and feel of Printmaster into Printmaster Plus, which, as you are about to see, was a superior product. It's time to load up Printmaster Plus. I have queued up my Pi 1541 with my Printmaster Plus disk image, my additional art gallery disk images, and my Printmaster data disk, which is simply a standard D64 disk image for ultimately saving my work. 
At this juncture, I need to give a very important piece of advice and warning about using fast loader cartridges. Unlike its predecessor, Printmaster Plus does not ship with a disk-based fast loader. Therefore, you are absolutely going to want to use a fast load cartridge, otherwise your workflow is going to be painfully slow even by 1980s standards. However, cartridges that include a fast saver tend to crash Printmaster Plus as soon as you go to save your design, thus possibly wiping out all of your work. If you've watched my Basic Bytes videos for any length of time, you know that my go-to is the Final Cartridge 3. Don't program without it. But of course we aren't programming today, and the crash on fast save is one of the reasons why I am using the Epix Fast Load instead. The good old Epix Fast Load is an excellent choice, as is the better working Turbo Load and Save in Basic Version 2 mode, not Basic Version 4 mode. If you are stuck using a fast loader cartridge with a fast saver, there's a relatively simple workaround in that you can poke memory location 818 with value 237 and poke memory location 819 with the value of 245 before you run Printmaster Plus. These two bytes in RAM are a vector which points to the save routine, and these values will reset it to point back to the default kernel save routine, thus bypassing any fast saver on your cartridge while leaving the fast loader active. Despite that this is an option, I am still not using my Final Cartridge 3, because freezer cartridges also tend to blank the screen whenever they load, and because Printmaster Plus is constantly loading many small files, I find the constant screen blanking, quite frankly, to be a petty annoyance. With that, let's run the software. Printmaster Plus was released in 1987, the year after the lawsuit, by Unison World, which it now says is a division of Kyocera Unison Incorporated, as Unison World was actually bought out by Kyocera by this point in time. With the software loaded up, we can immediately see a bit of a design difference in the layout already, as we now have this stacked two-column menu at the bottom, and certain options have been renamed, such as Sign to Poster. When you first load the software, you're going to want to go into Hardware Config to do a one-time setup for the correct type of printer. Within the menu to Set Printer Type, we see that there are a reasonable number of options. I found it interesting that there were entries for both Commodore 1525 and Commodore 801, given that the command sets of those two printers are identical. I loaded both drivers into memory and did a compare, and sure enough, they are the exact same code, simply duplicated for user convenience. If you have a 1525, an 801, or an 803 as I do, this is the driver you want to use. On the other hand, if you have a Commodore 1000 series printer from the later part of the 1980s, the Commodore 1000 driver should perform well for any of that series of printers. Mine is already set up for the correct driver, so I shall simply press the up arrow to go back to the previous menu. The other thing to take notice of in here is set end of line character. This will either be carriage return only or carriage return with line feed. Most printers, including Commodore printers, automatically line feed with every carriage return, which is why the default here is carriage return only, but some printers will need carriage return with line feed. At this point, you can test your printer to ensure that your setup is correct, which I already know mine is, and you can also format a data disk. Some programs use custom formatted floppy diskettes in order to store their data files. Printmaster Plus does not. 
All this option does is simply format a standard 1541 disk with the title PM data, and you do not have to use this option if you already have any standard formatted five and a quarter inch floppy disk or D64 file for that matter. With that, we are all done with our setup. The design that we're doing today is a poster, which in previous versions of this software was called a sign. So we'll proceed to make a new poster. And here we see the fantastic design change of Printmaster Plus, which is that we are no longer forced to create or modify our publications in a strictly linear fashion. Here at the bottom, we can design or modify any of the elements of our publication at any time. If we were using the print shop or the original printmaster, at the end of our design process, we would end up in the preview and print screen where it would show us a preview of our design, and that preview almost never looks exactly like what you intended, and so you probably will end up needing to go back several times to make changes. In Printmaster Plus, I cannot overemphasize how much of a time saver it is to be able to come back out of our preview and print screen and then be able to go directly to whatever design element we wish to change, edit that, and go directly back to preview and print. To make my initial draft, I will go through the design steps in order, beginning with selecting a border. A good number of the borders included in Printmaster Plus are hyper-specific and generally useless for generic publication, such as, for example, ants for a picnic announcement, or Christmas for anything Christmas-related. When in doubt for most publications, your go-to vanilla border is going to be the thin line, or alternatively, the paper border, which is simply a 3D sort of version similar to the thin line. Knowing that I'm designing a proclamation sign, I'm going to select the thick line, which for certain publications can be too severe of a border, but knowing that a proclamation is a bold announcement, I think this one will work very well. Next is the first or main graphic of a maximum of two that can fit in memory. The file format for graphics did not change between Printmaster and Printmaster Plus, therefore any image that works in one of the programs should work just fine in the other. In this case, I know that the image I want is on a supplementary disk of artwork, so I select another disk, and I flip my Pi 1541 to the other disk and press return. After a moment of reading in the directory, the various images on the disk will appear in a list. At this point, I'm going to page through the list of images on the disk until I see the name of the one I'm looking for. And there it is. If I press the Commodore key, it will load a preview of the image from the disk, and this is the lovely crown that we're going to use as the centerpiece of our sign. The user's guides for Printmaster and its supplementary art galleries have the catalogs of images within them, and those should be your primary method of selecting which pieces of artwork you wish to use, as loading from the Commodore key to preview any quantity of images on screen gets very tedious very fast. Once we've selected the image, I will flip back to the program disk and hit return. In selecting your graphic size, regular size is going to give you a good, sensibly sized image most of the time. Half size tends to be more useful if you are picking a secondary image that you wish to place around the main one, whereas, on the other hand, with double size, you almost inevitably get some of your text overprinting the graphic since it's taking up so much real estate on the page. 
For that reason, I usually start with regular size as a default. In layout options, the diagonal layout which tiles the image diagonally as you see in the preview also very much tends to clash with text unless the image you're laying out is simply meant to be some sort of a background pattern. Freehand layout is what we want. We can now lay out the image as many times on the page as we wish, and I'm going to want the crown and some text centered, therefore I'm going to shift the crown one above center, select that box with return, and then hit the Q key to signal that I'm done laying it out. Back at the main menu, I'm going to repeat that process to select my second supplementary graphic, which is also on another disk. The angel is what I'm going for as a secondary or accent image to the crown, because not only is it thematically appropriate for the passing of a monarch, but it is also a nod in hindsight to His Majesty's excellent first address to the Commonwealth on the 9th of September, in which his concluding words were the quote from Hamlet, Flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Because it is a secondary image, I'm going to half-size this one. And in terms of layout, I think it will do very well in the white space in the upper two corners, given that I'm going to be placing the text on the lower half of the design. Next, we move into the text editor, which is actually quite flexible in what it's able to do, but getting it to do exactly what you want can often be as much of an art as a science. This screen asks you to pick a main font for your publication. Once you get into the text editor, you can alter what font is used for any individual line of text. This screen more so gives you the opportunity to actually see what the individual fonts look like and their relative size to one another because the text editor is not a what you see is what you get as we have in the modern day. The other thing about these fonts that differs from the modern day is that there isn't a freeform size selection. Every font has a fixed size, and some are larger than others. For this design, I know I'm making a proclamation sign, and I know that scribe has a nice Old English look to it. Furthermore, I know that the biggest block of text on my sign is going to be verbatim the proclamation that was issued by the United Kingdom, which is, The Queen is dead, long live the King and I know I want it to fit on two lines. So I'm going to select Scribe as my base font and test right away if it is possible to fit that with this font. And already we have run out of characters, not enough space left for the next one in this font. There is a text size option on the F3 key, but that only enables you to make a font double size, not half size, and therefore to proceed with the design as intended, I'm going to have to pick a smaller font. Reviewing the options, Hampton is not as large as Scribe, but also has an excellent traditional look and feel to it, befitting of a proclamation announcement, so it's the one I'm going to try next. If I continue typing on this line, success, I have fit all of the characters that I wish to fit on my longest line, and therefore Hampton is going to be my default font, although this was just a test, and I don't want that line right at the top of the publication. My vision for the design was that I was going to have the crown with the Queen's initials ER2 around the center of the poster, with the angels hovering above and the proclamation balancing it out on the lower half. Remembering that we placed the crown just above center, I'm going to try to cursor down to just below center, and I'm going to hit the F3 key to switch to large font, which you'll notice now takes up the space of two lines. 
I also know that I want Her Majesty's initials in the tallest suitable font possible and in a different typeface from our standard Hampton, which we're using for the proclamation text. The Times font seems to be the best fit, and if we hit F7, it so happens that it's the next one up on the list. I will now enter the initials as the center text of our poster. If you live in Canada, or indeed in any of the Commonwealth countries, you have probably frequently seen Her Majesty's initials ER2 appearing on the Royal Cipher and on various other materials having to do with the Queen. The reason why Her Majesty signed ER is because the R stands for Regina, or Regina, which is Latin for Queen. Regina seems to be the more popular pronunciation, unless of course you're talking about the capital city of the Canadian province of Saskatchewan, in which case it is always pronounced Regina. Following in this same tradition, the king will be signing his initials as Charles R, although in His Majesty's case, the R stands for Rex, which is Latin for king. My question now is whether I have at least two lines of Hampton font remaining on this page in order to include the proclamation. So, this is where we get into a bit of trial and error. Cursoring down once, cursoring down twice. Okay, yes, I do indeed have the two lines. Cursoring down once more. That kicks me out. So I have exactly two lines remaining below that text in order to put the proclamation, so that was well placed. To add that text, we go back into the text menu, but this is a gotcha. Once you have used multiple fonts on a page, you do not want to reselect the same font that you previously selected on this screen. If you do that, it will reset all of your lines to whatever font you pick here. So at this point, we want to change this to no change. This will keep every line of font face exactly as we set it. Cursoring down, we can see that the initials are still in the Times font, and now we add the proclamation text. This proclamation is in fact now a tradition which dates back hundreds of years, and in its initial form was The King is Dead, Long Live the King, as it was a male monarch passing on to another male monarch. If you are not a Commonwealth citizen and you are reading this for the first time, it may seem a little bit jarring and even disrespectful, as it may be incorrectly giving you the impression that it is somehow saying, well, the old monarch is dead, so let's celebrate the new one. That isn't exactly the emotion that is intended to go behind it. Within our British Commonwealth of Nations, there is no governmental process that makes a king a king. The king becomes the king immediately and automatically upon the death of the previous monarch, and this proclamation, therefore, more so simply acknowledges the reality of that moment. The time has come to preview our first draft, and this is where we wait for a few moments, so I will spare you the loading time. One thing to keep in mind as you look at this preview is that, as is the case today, in the 1980s, monitors did not have the same resolution as printers. The dot matrix printer that I'm going to be using is 60 dpi, which is 480 dots across the page, whereas the entirety of the Commodore 64's bitmap screen, of which this preview is only taking up a portion, is only 320 pixels. So when you look at the preview and you see various jagged edges on letters and such, one can assume that a lot of that is going to smooth out when you actually send this document to the printer. 
I do see one thing that I want to change though, and this is a good excuse to show you another feature in the text editor. By pressing the F5 key, there are three textures available to us. Standard is simply standard black lettering. Silhouette is outline lettering. And shadow essentially puts a drop shadow behind the text. Even though this isn't a what you see is what you get editor in most respects, the texture at least does show up on each line. I'm going to flip the texture over to silhouette which I think will be nicer because in effect, the fill of those letters will now be white or whatever color paper we're using. Returning to the preview screen, I believe I've got what I was looking for. Now the next very important step in this process is to save my work. My advice is to always save your publication before attempting to print it, because if there is some kind of a communications error with the printer on the serial bus, and you find that you're unable to recover from it, it could lock up and crash the entire program, thus causing you to lose all of the work you've done. Believe me, it's happened. I don't have a video camera on the printer, but I will certainly show you the results of this printout later in the video. In the meantime, I'd like to show you just a little bit more of Printmaster Plus, and once again taking the practical angle, once you've designed a publication such as this one, you'll find that instead of starting over from scratch, you can readily design other similar publications using the one that you've already done as a template. This is a proclamation sign, but with just a few quick changes, I'm actually going to modify this into a second sign, which is more of a pure in memoriam for the memory of Her Majesty. For that one, I think I'm going to use the option we haven't seen yet and double size the crown artwork so you'll get a chance to see what that looks like. Once again in the text editor, the first thing I'm going to do is take out all of the proclamation text since it no longer applies to the sign we're making. The initials I'm going to leave just as they are for the time being, and even though I could possibly add some text that says in memoriam or in memory or some sort of thing like that, I'm going to try something else first purely with graphics even though I'm limited to having two graphics on the page. This is where we get into the one thing about Printmaster Plus that does actually drive me up a wall. If I once again go into the menu for first graphic, every time I go in to modify the graphic, I have to go through this whole process of inserting my graphics disk, reselecting the graphic, and then going back to the main program disk. To me, there's no excuse not to have the option to simply change the layout of a graphic that's already in memory. In any case, I've once again selected the crown graphic, and this time we're going to double size it. Notice it takes us straight back to the menu, because there are no layout options for a graphic that large. It's simply going to be centered in the page. For the second graphic, I similarly want to keep the angel but just change the layout, but of course I have to go through this again. I have once again selected the angel graphic, and I want it to remain half size with a freehand layout, but this time I also wish to add it to the bottom two corners, as I think that having it in all four corners will help to balance out the design, with the bottom two occupying the otherwise cavernous white space that would be left by removing the proclamation. And with that, we can simply return to our preview to see what it looks like now. When it comes to placing images and text in the rudimentary editors that we're given, nothing is really to scale, and when you have 
overlaying text and graphics as well as tiled images, very often things will overlap or collide in a way that aren't really expected or complementary. In this case, though, the initials over the crown, because they're hollow, are still entirely readable. I do still want to make one change, though, and that is to the thick black border, which worked for a bold proclamation, but I find is a little bit too heavy and severe for what I'm trying to do with this sort of a design. I could just replace the thick line border with the thin line border, which is like vanilla in that it's appropriate for just about anything, but I have a different idea, and I will try making that change immediately through the magic of editing. And looking at the preview, at least as crudely as it's rendered on screen, I do believe I like it. So with those few changes, that is our second design complete. I will now proceed to save and print. Stick around to see how they came out. I think I'm going to upload both of these high-resolution scans to my file share, which is located at files.basicbytes.ca. The images can provide you with the most detailed look at the sort of quality one could expect from an MPS-803 printer. We are, of course, keeping things very respectful towards Her Late Majesty, but if you wish to, by all means, leave me a comment to let me know if you think I hit the mark, or whether or not you would have done something differently, or perhaps even used a completely different program, in which case I am curious to know what that would have been. I will call your attention to one more thing, and that is that I fixed the second design after I printed it. Even though I liked the preview on screen, when I saw it on paper, there was too much collision between the pixels of the lower two angels and the crown. The software is smart enough to keep the inside of outline text hollow, but where graphics overlap each other, all of the pixels simply get smashed together. So I simply copied and pasted portions of the other angels to make the bottom two angels opaque rather than transparent. You might think that I would want to obfuscate the fact that I did this, but quite the opposite, it was in fact one of the best things that could have happened because it perfectly demonstrates that even though printers replacing typewriters opened up a whole new world of possibilities, very often the software of the 1980s was still only good enough to get your publications most of the way there. Frequently, your final step would be physically cutting and pasting various elements of your page, whether it was to add additional graphics, or hand-drawn artwork, or you were adding lines and rules for a sectioned design, or even taking a marker and some whiteout to touch up a few lines and curves. That would then result in your physical master document, which you would then take to the print shop, I mean the brick-and-mortar print shop down the street, where you would make as many photocopies as you needed. For anyone who's going to dive into vintage desktop publishing after this video, in the description I have linked to the Printmaster User's Guide, as well as a separate paperback book entitled The Creative Printmaster. Written by one of the same individuals who wrote the user's guide, that book centers around but is not exclusive to the Printmaster series of software and is essentially a design guide on how to make aesthetically pleasing page layouts using the tools that were commonly available in the mid-1980s. If you found today's video informative or enjoyable, please like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. I thank you very much for watching, and God save the King.